Hello and welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. Glad you joined us today. Praise God, we're going to have a good study. We're going to be talking about America shutting down. We're talking about a world of fear and uncertainty. And we certainly live in that world right now. And God gives us some good hope from Scripture. And we're going to be looking at that closely in just a moment. Before we do, Brother Tim Parton is going to be on the piano. He's going to play some, some music and maybe sing and have prayer. We're just going to turn it over to him right now. And I'm sure you're going to be blessed. Thank you, Kenny. We certainly serve a God who is a God of hope. And I am grateful that he can be depended on. He can be trusted no matter what you're going through. The psalmist knew full well as he wrote Psalm 103. Sometime we need to give ourselves a little pep talk. We need to talk directly to our soul. And um, out, of, out of that thought came this psalm. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits praise the Lord O oh my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sin who heals all Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sin, thank you, Lord, and he Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your strength is renewed like the eagle. Father God, thank you, Lord, that we can run to you. And we can find strength and hope and peace in you. Father, you have forgiven us when we have called out to you for forgiveness. You have supplied our need. You have met every need we need. So we thank you, Father, for that. Lord, you are faithful. So today I just ask for those who are watching, who have needs, physical needs, Lord, they need a touch from you. They need a, a spiritual touch from you. They need encouraging. They need to know that you are near. Oh God, I pray in Jesus' name, draw near. Your word tells us if we will draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. So I just ask that you'll give us wisdom to draw close to you. Lord, we cannot make it alone. And you say that we don't have to. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Bless the Lord. Father, for those who are going through emotional situations that uh, they just need a touch from you, God. Those who are going through financial needs, 
Lord God. Provide for them in ways that they know that it only had to be your hand that provided. Lord, you redeem us from all our sin and you crown us with joy and peace. You satisfy our desires with good things. So we claim these benefits as your children, as your people. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to be encouragement to our neighbor. Father, may we not be consumed with our own need, but out of our own need, may we learn to give and, and share what we have with others. For we always have the good news of Christ that we can share. We're never without something to share. So I just pray a special blessing over those who are viewing, those who are listening. In Jesus' name, be encouraged today. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul and forget not all his benefits. Thank you so very much, Brother Tim. Appreciate that so much. Prayer and praise and song, this is what it's all about in this hour that we're living in. Again, we're glad that you've joined us here today as we spend a little bit of time talking about America shutting down. Is that a possibility that America is shutting down? Can it be shut down? What kind of world are we living in today? We live in a world of fear and uncertainty. You know, I just want to go back and we'll go over several things that's been going on in the news lately. But we also go to the Word of God where we gather hope and encouragement during this crisis of Earth's history. You know, many of us, many of us are dealing with fear and sadness as this coronavirus, this uh, COVID-19, continue to bring havoc on this country and the world. It's causing problems socially and economically, spiritually, you know, in every which way we're looking. People are really concerned of what's going on. Will there be an end? You know, this virus has been a pestilence. Interesting, I just heard President Trump say yesterday, he called it a plague. Very interesting thought, a plague. It's plagued our society at a time, I believe, it's part of Bible prophecy. And I'm going to talk about a couple of things here that might be a little disturbing to some, but I want you to have food for thought as we set a foundation. But before we set that foundation, as always, I want to just have another quick prayer, if you don't mind. Let's pray together, shall we? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. We ask now that thy Holy Spirit will be with us. We pray that you will consume our hearts, our minds, and our lives. We'll give hope and encouragement during this dark hour of earth's history. Bless us now, we pray to this end. Forgive us of the sins and mistakes. And we pray that we'll hear and receive the Holy Spirit today in abundance. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I thought that was big words coming. You know, a lot of times we have those in uh, high places that are talking about things going on in, in the world. And they're using things right out of the Bible, right out of Bible prophecy, and maybe not even realizing what they are saying. But those who have been studying the Word of God, you know what they're, been, what they're saying and what it pertains to. There's a lot more going on than meets the eye. You know, this, to me, it's just, it's just another piece of the puzzle that, you know, in, in, in the whole world, it's like a, a, a prophecy is a big puzzle. And there's pieces being put in every day. And this is another piece of that puzzle. And it's going to bring us together, believe it or not, for some of you, under the, we're talking about under the new world order of this earth. This is where it's all boiling down to. So let's keep our minds open, throw some things out here and see what you think about them. You know, we're, we're quickly losing our freedoms. Every day that we wake up, we've lost, it seems, another freedom. At what? For the common good of others, as we find our national government, our local governments, and they're literally daily implementing uh, new guidelines and what they call a war against the virus. 
And so there is a virus, there is something going on. Many people have had their head buried in the sand and they're saying, oh, well, you know, that's, uh, I don't really believe in that. Well, we need to open our eyes and realize this is more than just a virus out there. This is the telling us, the Bible is telling us that Jesus is soon to come. We need to be ready. This, it's bigger than the virus. It's called the sin issue that we must deal with. Keep in mind, there are those who have said, now remember, remember, I'm throwing some things out there for us just to think about and see how they might apply, or maybe you say they don't apply. There are those who have been recorded as saying that uh, they need population control. And they want to do it through vaccines. I don't know what your thought is about vaccines. But these are things we have to look at, things we need to be praying about, things we need to act upon. Because I believe this time is certainly coming. It's here. It's here and we're going to have to act on these things quickly. People who have a lot of money, we're talking billions of dollars, have made the public statements. They said, you know what? It, we're going to have to give this vaccine because it will help control the population. Because they say it's, you know, there's too many people on the earth. And then if you don't have that uh, vaccine, if you don't get a vaccine uh, so that you can or use your survivor of this virus, if you don't have that paperwork, you really can't travel. Very, very interesting when you think about that. What will that lead to? What could that lead to? You have to have a piece of paper to say that I've had a shot or that I've survived the virus or I'll not be able to travel. I'll not be able to go any place. Interesting. Could it possibly lead to the point to where, and if God sees, that it might lead to the point of you not be able to buy or sell? Could it come to that point? Absolutely. We're seeing things now out of the ordinary taking place. Laws are being passed. In fact, you know, like states, just as Illinois, for instance, since we live here, they're looking into passing a law that requires all vaccinations mandatory for children who wish to attend school. So it's going to be mandatory that we have to take this, these shots. Parents in Illinois will no longer be able to claim religion as a reason, you see, to refuse vaccination of their children. See, this is the time that we're living in. This is the time that we need to realize with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind that, you know, whether we believe that this is taking place or not, it is taking place. It is taking place in the world, whether we believe that this virus was uh, originated, it came from a lab, or whether it came from the, uh, Wuhan there, or maybe it could possibly be, you hear very little said about it, could it be that we have been transgressing the laws of health? Could it possibly be that we're taking the wrong things into our system? And this is a way of getting a release from that, and so coming out here so we can take a look at it and maybe change some things. And then, you know, I've heard a lot about dangerous amount of radiation coming from this 5G, which basically has some of the same uh, effect symptoms as the virus does. But regardless of its origin, regardless of where it came from, people are becoming ill. They're becoming very sick and the hospitals are being flooded. Doctors and nurses, there seem to be overworked. What are we going to do about that? We, is there anything that can be done because they're overwhelmed? They're putting their life on the, on the line. And then it seems, though, that then they have a hard time. They have to go home, and then they worry about infecting their own family and their own children and their own loved ones. Man, what an hour that we live in in the history of this world. America shutting down a world of fear and uncertainty. Think about it. After several weeks, we can say get us several months now here, nonstop broadcasting. We hear it every day. This is all that we hear on radio and all we hear on TV about this lady, latest pandemic, COVID-19. It's 24-7 work going on. It's going on with the government. It's going, in, you know, again, at the state, uh, the local levels. You know, hospitals are, are over, again, we've mentioned overwork. The greatest minds in the medical field have come together. They're working on something that will fix this virus, something that we can take that will help us get rid of this virus. And some headway seems to be made. People are praying. People are fasting. People are seeking the face of God. But you know, it seems not to be fast enough for some people. They say we need something else to take place. Why? At least three quarters of the United States of America right now is asked to stay home. You know, how can you run an economy if three quarters of the population stays at home? How long can this go on without economic collapse? Because the Bible does predict that 
And it is going to happen, whether it's now or whether it's later down the road. But we need to be, put our minds around this and focus on us. We're asked to stay home. We're the shutting down of America, this country. Will the economy hold up? When will this virus come to an end? Will it come to an end? We want it to come to an end, not, not just today. We want it to come to an end yesterday. But what is God trying to tell us through all of this? Who's to blame? Oh, we find a lot of people talking about, well, we can blame this group, we can blame that group, and we blame all of this and that. Let's just put the blame on where it goes. And certainly, number one, would be the enemy, would it not? In first selected messages, 269, there's a couple of paragraphs here, and maybe kind of a, maybe a long reading here, but I want you to pay special attention to it. First selected messages, 269. And notice what it says. Satan looked, and now we're talking about here at the time of Christ, upon the result of his temptation to the increase of sin in the continued transgression of God's law. For more than 4,000 years, notice that, he had worked the ruin of our what? Of our first parents huh. and brought sin and death into the world. Who's the one that brings sin and death into the world? It is the enemy for sure. Now notice what he did. He had led the ruin to ruin multitudes of the ages, to ruin, as it were, the countries, all classes, he had by his power controlled the cities and nations until their sin provoked the wrath of God to destroy them by, now notice this, by fire, by water, by earthquake, sword, famine, and pestilence. Boy, you talk about interesting statement there. You could spend a lot of time on that. Notice we see these things happening right now that the enemy has been controlled. Remember, when every person has been born on this planet, you know, has fell underneath the power of the enemy except for one. So the enemy's kind of had things the way that he wanted them, and certainly until the cross. But now he's still claiming that he is still the head. He still wants to sit in Christ's place. He's leading men to sin, to break God's law. And then what does God do after a while? He, he gives over to that. And he simply says right here that he, he, the fire, floods, Pestilent. These things that we see happening in the world today, the judgments of God falling in the land, we need to stop saying they're going to happen. They're going to fall. This is going to take place. That's going to take It's taking place right now, and only by the grace of God will we continue on, you see, with the blessings of the Lord. He's wanting to bless some people, and He's going to be blessing some people, those who honor Him. And so I certainly have a, you know, a question for each and every one of us here. Could, could our time be up? Think about, could our time really be up right now? What about our probation as a nation, as an individual? Could it be that it's almost expired? Maybe, maybe we've gone too far. Is it possible we've gone too far? After all, we push God out of everything we possibly can push Him out of. And people just day by day ignoring God, ignoring what God's will is for, ignoring His word and doing what we want to do. There comes a time that God will rise up and God's voice will be heard, and God's voice will be obeyed. But could it be that we've gone too far? Or is this a time that God is simply warning us one more time, get ready, get ready, get ready. These things are upon the land. I mean, after all, in studying and reading the Word of God, we can find out surely that God gives nations and people and individuals a certain amount of probationary time. And when that time is up, that's it. How close is it to your time? Is your time maybe up? Or what is God doing here to us? How is He speaking to us? I like the book of Luke, Luke chapter 21, verse 26. Luke 21, 26. Now, think about this, and I want to make this clear. This passage of Scripture, certainly the last couple of lines refers to the, we're talking about the seven last plagues when God is going to be shaking the heavens. But I believe the principle of this word here we need to think about. It says, Men's hearts failing them for fear and looking, notice, after those things which are coming on the earth. Notice that. What are for the things that are coming up? Men's hearts are doing what? Failing them for fear. And this right here means they're fainting. That means their lack of breath. You ever hear somebody that gets them maybe fearful? You shock them, you say boo, and they scream, Oh, I can't breathe. Men's heart are failing them for fear. They are afraid. They're in terror of what's happening. I've talked to people who are scared to death of what's going on right now. Should we really be that scared? 
Well, certainly is a reality, and certainly these deaths and these afflictions, you know, are for real. But how should we as Christians approach this? There are four, I'd like to call it four great uh, motives, you know, that, that moves people into action. You know, I like people that's moved into action. I like people that are action people. I like to be around the movers and the shakers, things that are going on. But there's four things, notice this, that move people into action. Number one is fear. Number two is hope. Number three is faith. And number four is love. These four things bring people to the point of action. Of course, fear is in first in order. Sometimes fear is nothing more than a superficial anxiety. A lot of people, millions, have that in the world today, but sometimes it's pretty deep-seated. And if it's not controlled, if things, changes are not made, it turns into a, a, a panic situation. How do you deal with people in a panic situation? It's hard to deal. It's hard to, you know, just to, to, to try to reason with someone who's in a panic situation. Fear can manifest itself. You say, well, how does fear manifest itself? It can manifest, manifest itself in a lot of different ways. Uh, for instance, fear of what? What we're going through right now, shutting down of America, is the fear of losing our job. Look at the millions that have lost their job. Look at the millions who are not, not knowing where their next paycheck is going to come from. Look at the, uh, the millions that's going on and say, I don't know how I'm going to pay my electric bill, my house, or my car payment. I don't know how that I'm going to get by. This, these things are real. And they need to be addressed the way that God would have us to address them. So the fear of losing a job. How about this? The fear of growing old. Many people are fearful of growing old. Uh, many people are fearful of uh, a disease, catching a certain disease, dying of a certain disease. And there's many people who live in fear of being, now listen carefully, of being exposed. Exposed for something they said, something that they've done. Something that's went on, they don't want to be brought to light, but they are afraid of that. And sometimes we talk about it, what we're talking about now is we fear the, a troublesome thing called a virus. <laughs> it's named a coronavirus. Should we fear these things? Is it right to fear them? Is it good to have a healthy respect for these things? People are fearful, people are concerned, and people are looking for answers. That's why they're going the places that they're going. They're telling, making the telephone calls. They're meeting. They're going back. Try to, try to go to church where you can't go right now. But they're even meeting outside and speakers are out there. People's wanting to hear the word of God. This we know in 1 John 5 verse 12. This we know for sure because the Bible says so. You know, the Bible says here, He that hath the Son hath what? He that hath the Son hath life. And of course, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So we know as a Christian, now if you don't have Christ in your life, then may you don't have this hope. But if you have the Son, if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior right now, you have life. The Bible says you have it life and you have it certainly more abundantly. But if you don't have Him, you don't have any life. I ask myself the question a lot of times is how do people make it? How do they make it if they don't have Christ in their life? They don't have someone they can turn to, someone that they can talk to, your closest friend, someone that you know can move mountains, someone that you know can change situations, someone that you know that you can talk to that cares about what you're going through. Well, we know who that is. That's certainly Jesus, isn't it? Fear causes people to, to, to act differently. They act strange. When they, you ever been around somebody that's really is afraid and all of a sudden they're just, they're just like, they're out of their mind. They don't, you don't know what they're going to say. You don't know what they're going to do. I'll give you a little quick example, a little story about a woman just returned from Mexico. And she turned, returned from Mexico to the States. Immediately she called the police. So I'm calling the police. Why are you calling the police for? Because there's a rattlesnake in my bag. A rattlesnake in your bag? Well, let's, naturally she took it and threw it out the window and said, man, I need some, I need some help. So the police came out and they took all the contents. They opened the bag carefully and they put all the contents out there and they looked and they couldn't find. There, was not, there wasn't a rattlesnake in there, but what they found was a, notice this, an electric toothbrush that had been accidentally turned on. Now just think for a moment with me. I'm not saying what we are in is a, a, compared to an electric toothbrush. I'm saying it's a rattlesnake. I'm saying it's poison. And so we need some outside help. We need not fear because my Bible says in 1 John 4, 18, the Bible says, 
perfect love does something. What? I thought I heard you. I thought I heard you. Perfect love casts out what? All fear. I'm just going to leave it at that. Perfect love casts out all fear. And notice this. What about this thing called love? This thing called love here is a deliberate assent of the will to God. Did you get that? This thing called love is the deliberate assent of the will of God, huh, of the will to God. So have you really given yourself to Him? Have you really submitted your will to Him? And pray, not my will, but thine be done. Certainly in this time, perfect love casteth out all fear, and that means being afraid. We need not be afraid. We concerned? Absolutely. Follow the rules and regulations where we can? Absolutely we should be doing that. This is how the enemy wants to try to get rid of you and try to get rid of me. But where do we get this kind of wisdom? Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 1, verse 7, Proverbs 1, verse 7, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Of wisdom or knowledge. But fools despise the what? The wisdom and instruction. So the main point we're looking here, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The respect, accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. After all, we do live in a fearful time, do we not? Absolutely, we live in a fearful time. And since we live in that time, then I believe that we need to look at a few Bible passages here as quickly as we can and claim each one. Remember, the Bible here is full of Bible promises. And that we can look at these Bible promises, we can read those Bible promises, put our finger on those Bible promises, and claim them as your own. It's going to take some faith. How is your faith? Have you been exercising your faith lately? Have you been studying the Word of God? Have you been spending time in prayer? Or you have just neglected it? You realize we're in a, a very awesome time in earth's history. You realize some things going on that you just can't explain. You don't know how it's going to end up. But now all of a sudden you want to get back in relationship with God. Well, that's good news, but is it because of fear? Or is it because you've recognized that you've fallen short and you've neglected God and you want to come back to Him? He wants you to come. He said, I came to seek and save that certainly which was lost. Let's look up several passages quickly. Then the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. I'm not going to read all of that, Isaiah 41, verse 10. But I want you to just notice, Isaiah 41, verse 10. says, Fear not, I love this, fear not, for I am what? I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. What a wonderful promise. First of all, do you notice Isaiah says, fear not. First thing, when angels appeared and so on to man, they'll say, fear not. Don't be afraid. There's help that is arising, uh, will arrive for you. Fear not, I am with thee. Don't be dismayed. Don't be torn up. Don't be thrown from side to side, not knowing what to do. You know, somebody will call you for encouragement. Pretty soon you've discouraged them. No, encourage them with the word of God. Don't be dismayed. Why? God said, don't be, because I'm God. Why? Because I can change things. I can order, as I word of the heavens, I can order things in the earth. I can clean things up. God can clean it up just like that if He so chooses. If not, maybe He's going to see us go through this time of trouble, as it were. That our relationship with Him might be what it needs to be. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. I love this passage of Scripture, too. It says, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. Again, it's just a couple of lines of that. Read the whole verse when you have time to do that. Fear not, for I am what? I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by, oh, thy name, thou art mine. I mean, how personal can that be? To me, that's very, that's very personal. <laughs> Fear not, number one, I have redeemed thee. And notice this, such a personal relationship with God that he says, I call you by name, by your first name. I know every hair on your head. I know everything that you're going through. I know exactly what you need. And sometimes we think we need the things of the world. We need to know what, you know. God said, you just need me. Now's the time to make that decision for him. There's too many riding on the fence. They've been riding on it for such a long period of time. Jesus is soon to come. Probation is going to come. Trumpet after trumpet is sounding, as it were. Alarm after alarm. It's an emergency time. If you don't, we don't see it now. Maybe we're never going to see it, but pray that God will impress that on your mind. He said, I know your name. You're mine. Can anything happen to you unless God gives approval? No, God has to give approval because he said you're mine. But you have to turn your life over to him or you're not his at all. Isaiah 44, verse 8. Notice Isaiah 44, verse 8. Just a, just a line of it. it says, fear not, I will help thee. 
Man, if we ever needed help, if we're in a society that we live in, a world that we live in, and all the things that are going on, men's hearts are failing them for fear. Things are coming on this earth. People are committing suicide. They're torn up. They're worried about the economy and things that are going on because they have not God. But he says, fear not. I'm going to help you. That's a promise. So when you're feeling down and out and maybe like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to be able to go on. By God says in his word, don't fear. I'm going to help you. But you know what? He stands at the door and knock. You've got to let him in. Let's let him in. He said, I'm going to help you. Again, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9. I like this one here because it gives us some, you know, some help uh, talking about the former things and the things to come. Notice, behold, the former things are come to pass. New things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. What a God that we serve. How wonderful to say before things happen, I'm going to let you know. These things here have been, for years, you're talking about Bible prophecy and students You've been studying the Word of God. You know these things are coming upon the earth. You know that they're, that they're happening. Instead of keep saying they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, it's now that we need to look at carefully. Because of the coronavirus, we realize an unpresidential shutdown you know, of activity in the United States and around the world. Just allow me to go over just a few things, again, to try to bring it into focus here. It seemed to come upon us so, so quickly. Like out of nowhere, this thing just happened. If you'd asked somebody three or four months ago, can, you, can, can America be shut down? Can three quarters of the population be told to stay in your house? Can you be told that you don't be outside? Can you be told you're going to be fined if you go outside? If you're told you're going to have to wear a mask, you're going to have to wear rubber gloves, many of you would have your socks off. But now we see that these things can happen. We say, well, this is kind of minute, but it's going to get worse as it goes on. The Bible says it's going to wax worse and worse. No, there's hope, there's encouragement. We understand that, but we have to look at the reality of what the Bible teaches. We realize these last movements we know will be rapid ones. The authorities believe that the outbreak can change society for months. Now they're saying, oh, for years and some are saying, permanently, we'll never go back the way it was. As, you, as we well know, as we just look back, 9-11, 2008, and so on and so forth, we've never returned the way that it was. And this will be another issue that won't return if God so allows to revive us, and He allows us to revive us because He wants us to be revived again in Him. He's wanting us to make that last effort. Maybe he's making a last effort reaching out to you and reaching out to me. We might make a decision for him. So bad we realize President Trump declared the virus a national emergency. Why would he do that? Because it is an emergency. And because what? It opens up more resources to help those who are in need. I don't think I've ever seen, have you ever seen that uh, where all, the, all the schools are, are closed? Sporting events of every kind, is complete. <laughs> they've been canceled. Panic buying. It's unbelievable. You can't, you, can't, you can't go buy tissue. It's hard to buy some of the things because everybody, as soon as it comes in, they've got it and they went home with it. Empty shelves. In some stores, you thought, oh, this could never happen. Stock market, we realize, fell record levels. Record levels. And this caused more fear and anxiety. Virus confirmed in every state in the United States. And we know certainly around the world, normalcy. What's normal? Is there such thing as normal? Normal right now has been replaced by fear and anxiety and uncertainty. Governor Como said not too long ago, he said, my, my, we see like this, this thing. He said, first of all, this could last for a few months. Uh, two or three days later, he said, this thing can last for six months. A few days later, he said, it's going to last for months. Now he said, the lasting effects may be for years. Things are changing. Things have changed and they may not come back to normal. All states have banned, you know, large gathering. We understand that. And so the concern to me was the church doors are closed. Has the devil won? Are we not fighting the good fight of faith? Is something wrong here that the, the, the doors of the church are closed? That just may be the doors of a building. That doesn't mean our work has come to a close. That means we need to work harder than ever before. But the enemy thinks if we close the church doors, people's going to get discouraged. I think it's going to backfire on him. I think there's going to be more people that's going to come back. We've received texts and emails already. People saying, you know, I've, I've been away from God too long. I need to get back. How do I get back? 
I need to get back to God because I see these are the end days. Could it ever be that we cannot, you know, maybe we're going to be standing six feet apart from now on. We'll be wearing masks and rubber gloves. Only God knows, but right now the reality of it is and the new norm, the new norm I keep hearing about voluntary, you know, we talk about a, a quarantine and restrictive quarantine and quarantine by law and shelter in place and words I really haven't heard and all these new phrases coming out. Is this the new norm? Broadway closing down, Disney closing down, that's no big deal. Beaches are being shut down. Of course, you're always going to have those who are going to say what? Oh, well, I'm not going to be doing this. Well, you're going to find out that you will one way or the other. When the laws are passed, we're in a time now for the sake of this country and of the world. Laws will be passed. You will say, I know we have a constitution. We have a bill of rights. Every one of those things will be circled around and we'll be able to keep them on paper, but they won't mean anything. Man has already found a way to go around every one of them to get what we feel is best for this country and for this world, even if it steps on a lot of other people. Shutting down. Interesting what they said. Now listen to this and compare it with Bible prophecy, those of you who are students or those who have been reading. Now remember, talking about prophecy, first of all, is we warn you. And so the warning went and most people did not listen to the warning. And then they said, we're going to fine you. And then many people still did not listen. And so in New York did. They just doubled the, the fine to like $1,000 if you're caught out doing something that maybe not, you're not authorized to do. And then what, what happens? After that, if you don't listen, they arrest you and put you in jail. What's after that? Does that not sound like some other laws that are in the making even right now? And certainly we go have to look at too, as first of all, is you're going to be warned. We're talking about Sunday observance. We understand that. We're talking about you're warned and then you're going to be fined and then you're going to go what to jail. And then after that, there is a death decree that Revelation 13 talks about. Hundreds, worldwide, hundreds of thousands have been infected. Thousands of deaths. What will it take? God's trying to get our attention trying to give us encouragement, trying to give us hope. In some places, you realize this, in some places of the world, doctors are making the decision of who lives and who dies because there's not enough equipment. Did you ever think you'd live in a time, and even this, this country, that we would run out of things that we couldn't handle, you know, we didn't have enough beds to handle the sick? Could it just be, in early writings, page 41, could it possibly be now, before I read that, I want you to think, early writings 41, here's what some have made. And, of course, every day it's th this channel is making this statement, this one's making that statement. But they said here, if we don't get this under, if we don't stop this in the United States, at least half of the population will come down with this infection, the virus. And notice this, and as much as 2 million people can die. Well, that may be far-fetched from some, that may be a strain, but something has to be done. And certainly we're praying that God will intervene and help. But what is God doing? God has evidently allowed this to take place. Is he trying to reach his people? I just wonder, early writings, 41, says, I saw that the powers of earth are now being shaken. What is it? I saw that what? The powers of what? Huh? Of earth are now being shaken. The events that are in order, war and rumors of war, sword, famine and pestilence, Notice this, our first to shake the powers of the earth. Now notice I picked some of those lines out of there, but just notice. I saw the powers of earth are now being what? They're being shaken. And it, 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 notice this, it says the events come in order. God wants things to be order. He's a God of order and things are going to come in order. And if we're following that order, we can know where we're at in the stream of time. War, yes. Rumors of war, yes. Sword, that means death, yes. Famine, yes. Pestilence, yes. These are first to shake the powers of the earth. My, my brothers and sisters, should we not be shaken ourselves to the very point that God has pinpointed these things and ask us to step forward right now to be the men and women He wants us to be in these last hours of earth's history? I love the book of Revelation and John in the book of Revelation was shown in vision things that will turn this world upside down before he comes. 
This world is going to be turned upside down. If you think it's messed up now, if you think we're in trouble now, if we're having a difficulty staying, as it were, close by, we still have plenty of food, as it were. We still have, at least in the United States, and we have shelter, and we still have, you know, all the things, and we still have, have a car, and da, da, we get out, as it were, and just drive around. We think that's tough. We need to be praying because there's more that lies ahead, but God's wanting us to get stronger in Him day by day, living for Him. And maybe just... Uh, having a relationship with, with him that maybe we don't have right now. This is the importance of being prepared. This is the importance of not saying when these troubles and these trials and these tribulations comes, I'm going to be raptured away. You know that's a lie of the devil. If that be true right now, it'd be a good time to maybe be raptured away maybe. And it's just beginning. What about when it gets worse? No, God's people are going to go through the furnace of affliction because there's impurities that need to be what? <laughs> taken out. And God wants you to spend eternity with Him. He wants me and you to spend eternity with Him. The world to spend eternity with Him. You can make that decision, that choice today. But not looking at the things that we're talking about today is putting your head in the sand. We need to look around and say, my, these things are adding up. They're coming in in order. Could this be? Let me just throw it out there. Throw it back if you want to. Throw it out. Listen, could this possibly be this is the beginning of the time of trouble? Could we be that close? And if you really think of it like that, you'll want to get your life right. You'll want to make those necessary changes by the grace of God to say, I need to make this right because Jesus is coming. Could this be? The Bible certainly talks about that time of trouble, little time of trouble we know, and the big time of trouble. Because now we're experiencing, as we well know, earthquakes in diverse places. You remember that? Oh, absolutely. Matthew chapter 24, the fires and so on, strange weather conditions. Disasters by land and sea and air and pestilence and famine and political strife. My, my. Climate change. Going green. Closing down businesses. My, if we look at it right now, we're right. New Jersey's just closed things down. These what they say on Sunday because they're going to be closing down on Sunday now. Places of the world are all considering closing down one day a week. For the climate. One day a week because they're looking around from overhead. They're looking down and seeing since we're not all traveling around and doing all the things we're doing and businesses are shut down that the air is cleaner. Hmm. So now they're coming to the thought, oh, well, but let's listen. If we take one day a week off, this is going to help us. This is going to help the, the world, is it? Closing down business, large and small, near economic collapse. Laws passed and more laws are going to be passed. There's no doubt about it in this country and around the world to try to take care of the problems that we have. See, they keep thinking the problems that we have, that we need to pass another law to do that rather than point everyone to God. This is where we lift up our head. Our redemption draweth nigh. No, no one wants to go through all these tests and all these trials and all these things. But tests and trials are God's little workmen to work inside of us to get rid of the impurity so that heaven can be our home. You might say, I want heaven to be my home today, do you? Are you willing to make that decision for Christ? Are you willing to change things in your heart and in your life to be what he wants you to be today? That's a decision. That's a choice we're going to have to be making. What do you think? Really, what do you think? Have we really arrived at the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24, verse 8? Have we really begun? Have we, is this really the time of the sorrow? And should we possibly consider 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14? If you'd allow me, I'm going to read that because there's things in it that we need to consider some principle here before I read that. 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14. Are we going to be willing to walk in the, before God, doing all that He has commanded us to do, to observe all of His statutes and His laws and His judgment? In 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14, let me read it here. It says... If I shut up heaven and that there be no rain. Is God, can God shut the heavens? Absolutely he can. If I command the locusts to devour the land. If I send, notice this, pestilence. That's I me. Mean, pestilence is something that destroys. Are we not in this time here, this virus, something that destroys? If I send pestilence among my people, verse 14. If my people, you know this, which are called by what? Or we're called by my name shall, number one, we need to be humbling ourselves before God. We need to be praying and seeking his face. Turn from the wicked ways. Notice what he says. Then, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and will heal, heal their land. 
These are things that we're looking for. This is what the world's saying. We need some, we need some, we need some answers. We need some real answers. And God is giving it to us right here. He said, I can shut the heavens if I want to, that it doesn't rain. We've seen that in Scripture. We understand that. And if I could send the locusts, then they come and they devour everything. Yeah. If I send any kind of a pestilence or something that destroys among my people, all you have to do, he said, if my people, that means the ones who accept him as the Lord and Savior, they're called by my name. You're saying, I'm a Christian. I'm Christ-like. Well, my, let's not be a lukewarm or pathetic individual who calls himself a Christian and you're following after the enemy. Is that okay to say that? This is the challenge that we are at. He's talking about, God said, I'm going to answer the prayers of my people, those who will be obedient to what he has said in his word, those who are willing to what? follow what he said. To be humble, if, if you'll humble yourself. So now it says, here's, here's the healing. Here's the antidote. Here's what we need right now. Oh, well, we, we need this shot. We need this over here. We need that over here. Well, if we will just humble ourselves before God and then we begin to pray. If you begin to seek the face of God, how long has that been? How long has that been since we really got down on our knees and we began to seek the face of God? The old song says, how long has it been? You see, how long has it been since we knelt by our bed and prayed to the Lord in secret? How long has it been since we stayed on our knees? You see, until God has heard our prayer. Oh, many times we don't have time to pray. We're too busy. We're too busy running around. We're going here. We're going there. We got everything in our mind. We're, 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 we're maybe in, in ministry and we're just busy doing. We've got to fill the cup. You can't give what you have unless the cup is running over. God, fill our cups and help us to seek your face. Help us to pray. And then he says right here, we need to change our wicked, notice the our wicked ways. And then God says, I'm going to forgive their sins. Isn't what all we've been talking about here and what people will talk about, we should be talking about, is the sin issue. God said, I'm going to forgive your sins. And then notice this, I will heal the land. I'll take away the virus. I'll take away the diseases. I'll take away these things. If he said, he said <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 6, quickly, he says, Matthew 24, verse 6, See that ye be not troubled. That's just the last part. See that ye be what? See that ye be not troubled during this time. But it's hard not to be troubled. We need to be exercising faith like never before in the Word of God. When you see these things come to pass... Lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. Man, that's good news to me. That's so good. I pray that it's good for you. Lift up your head. Don't be downtrodden. Don't be looking down. But lift up your head to realize these are signs of the time. Jesus said, I'm not going to, these things are not going to happen. I'm going to warn you first. Then I'm going to bring them to pass. And I'm going to do it in order so that you're not confused. But we need to have faith in God. The Bible talks about this. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. He said, your bread and water is sure. All we have to do is claim that. We may not have nothing in your cupboard today, but God can fill that cupboard tomorrow. Your faith may be weak today, but certainly it can be, what, it can be expanded upon as we, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Spend some time. Faith, what? Whatever God has in mind, that's what I'm willing to do. That's what Jesus did as in result, was it not? Not my will, but thine be done. See that you be not trouble. Remember, there's only one remedy for God's people during the time of Israel. You remember what that was? One remedy for Israel. And there's only one remedy for the people of God today. You might say, oh, there's a lot of other remedies, a lot of other things going on today. We need to open our ears. Remember, there's many false Christs and many false preachers and teachers in the world today, and we have to distinguish by the Word of God which is true and which is false. The devil's working like never before. But there's only one remedy for God's people. There was only one remedy for Israel. And that was simply for them to admit that they had made mistakes. It was simply admit that they had sinned and come short of the glory of God. Simply admit they turned their back on God. Simply admit that they love the world and the things in the world more than they love God. My, if you think about that today. Huh. God says, if you do that, if you seek my face and you admit that we've done some wrong things, God said, I'm going to heal the land and let me just bring it close to home. God said, I'm going to heal the church. The church needs to be healed too. The land needs to be healed today. The church is God's people. We need a healing that only the Holy Spirit can bring in our hearts and our lives today as we commit ourselves to Him. He's promised to do it. We have to admit that we went the wrong way. Instead of trying to cover it up and say, well, we didn't, and, 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 and act like we didn't do it, admit that we did it and turn back to God. He said, I'm going to heal. I want to be healed, don't you? 
I want the power of the living God to be inside my heart and to my life. I want Him here. God said, I'm going to do wonderful things for our people. We are fighting a battle, and I mean a battle royale. It's a conflict for the soul. Let me give you some quick passage of Scripture here, because we're going to see in these Scriptures there's strife, and that we, we need to abstain. There's a war. We're going to have to fight. We're going to have to endure. But this is good news, because God said, I'll do it for you. I'll be right there with you. If you're my people, you'll hear my voice. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25, the Bible said, Every man that striveth for the mastery. Is there anybody striving for the mastery? Is there anybody that's striving to make heaven their home? And we're going to be tempered in all things. So my Bible said right then, we're going to make it. We're going to have to strive. We're going to have to fight. Just like we fight for things that we want in this world. I want a new car. I'm going to fight for that new car. I want a new home. I want to fight for that home. I'm going to do what it takes to get that home. I'm going to do what it takes to get that car. Strive, it says, 1 Peter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Did you get that? We're just a war against the soul. So we're talking about here striving. We're talking about a abstaining from, and we're talking about a war. We are in a warfare. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I like it, Paul, and I want this, I, I'd love to have this said about me by the grace of God as the end, I come to the end of my life, that I fought a good fight. My friends, have you fought a good fight? Have you finished the course? Some of you haven't even got into the race yet. You haven't even put your running shoes on. God's grace, say, pray for it to God, give me some running shoes. Give me some spiritual shoes. Give me a spiritual mind. Help me, O oh Lord, at the end, at the time, my time is up. I say, I fought a good fight. By the grace of God, you'll fight that good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6.12. Hebrews 10, verse 32. I'm moving quick, so it's hard to get all those. Hebrews 10, verse 32. It says, you, ye endured a great fight of affliction. Notice just the words quickly, please, with me. The word that right there is we have to strive for the mastery. We have to abstain if it's going to, heaven's going to be our home. We've got to fight the good fight of faith. We've got to fight, notice this, and we have to endure the fight of, this, of affliction. Is that what's happening in the world today? But the Bible is very clear in, in Mark 13, 13. He that endureth, Mark 13, 13. He that endureth unto the end, what? The same shall be saved. The same shall be saved. 2 Timothy 3, 11, Paul said, what persecution I endured. Interesting, he didn't fly out of any place, did he? He, did, he didn't miss it. He went right through it. We, got, we have to endure. So we're striving the mastery. We're abstaining. We're warring. We're fighting. We're enduring. Notice that. And we have to endure all things. Why? Because America is shutting down. You're going to have to make a decision who you're going to be serving. Is it going to be God? Is it going to be the world? And just what if? What if it becomes mandatory that you take these flu shots? And remember, in some of those things, we'll talk about another time, taking those flu shots, that you, you, you end up getting a paper. And if you get that paper, then you'll be able to travel. Hmm. If you don't have that paper saying you've had the virus shot, you won't be able to travel. Isn't that interesting that I would not be able to buy or sell? Could this be some part of it here that we need to open our hearts and open our minds? How quickly that has come about. There's a warfare being raged right now in Revelation 12, 7, 8, and 9. The Bible said here, just going a couple lines, there was war where? In heaven. Michael and his angels fought. The dragon and his angels fought, and they were cast out. Think not, that, friend, that right here, this is where the enemy was cast out to. This is where the battle is taking place. This is where the great controversy is taking place right now between good and evil. You need to decide. What side are you going to be on? Are you still going to be in limbo? Are you still going to be riding on the fence? Or are you going to make a decision for Christ today? Why not? Why not? People are looking. Thousands are turning to Him right now. It's backfiring on the enemy. He thought he's going to shut things down, but it's brought people to the thought of, oh, wow. Maybe this is the end of the world, and I really need to get my life right. I need to quit worrying about the world and things, and in the world, I need to be thinking about heaven. Let me ask a quick question. Should we be acquainted with the events that are taking place before Jesus comes? Should we be acquainted? Absolutely. A great controversy, page 594. Yes, yes, we should be acquainted with these things. Listen to these words. 
So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation. Did you get that? The events connected to the close of probation, the work of preparation for the time of trouble, are clearly presented. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Isn't that sad? You can sound alarm all you want. You know, a lot of people's not going to respond. We need to be praying for spiritual discernment. We need to be praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to consume each and every one of us. Most people don't want Bible truth, it seems, anymore because it interferes with their desires, their sinful, world-loving heart. And you know what? The enemy's going to give you those things if that's what you want. God's going to give you the desire of your heart. He says that in Psalms 21, verse 2. I encourage you to be wide awake. There's hope. There's encouragement. We need not be so concerned that we can't think things through and just simply say, My, the answer to all of this dilemma is Jesus Christ. Invite Him into your heart and into your life. This is your way out. This is my way out. This is the world's way out. Invite Him into your heart. Invite Him into your life. Why? Because He's coming soon. I know some of you are making decisions right now because you're worried about your job. You're worried about your family. You're worried about getting infected. You're worried about dying. But we rest our care upon him because he cares for us. I want to have just a short prayer for you right now. Would you just pray with me right now? I'm going to kneel here and we'll just pray together. The Holy Spirit will do great, wonderful things for you because the promises of God's word are sure. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the promises that you've given us. Even though we've looked at some things, and I was like, oh, oh, how horrible they are. But you are greater. Your love is greater. Your promises are greater. We need to reach out and claim you today. This is what we need in the world today more than anything else is Jesus in our hearts and in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for those who have made a decision. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you so very, very much for joining through ABN Worship Hour. We pray it's been a blessing. We pray that you've made that decision for Christ. And as you made that decision for him, what do you say? Why don't you write in, tell three of you, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I realize he's coming soon. I want to be ready. God bless you, and we'll see you again.